In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the Feast of St. Eusebius of uh, Vercelli in Italy, and uh, Bishop and Martyr. It's supposed to be red vestments, but the rose vestments are for tomorrow, for Gaudete Sunday. But I can only bring one set in the mass kit, so here it is. Also, this is the, we're coming into the last week before Christmas. And next week will be the Ember Days, Ember Wednesday, which is a day of partial abstinence and fast, Friday and Saturday. And Saturday is also the fast for Christmas Eve. So let's be generous with God in these Ember Days coming up to do penance for our sins and to make reparation to the heart of Jesus and Mary. Let's look at the life of St. Eusebius. He's, he's in the late 300s, early 400s. So it's the time of St. Athanasius. It's the time of the Council of Nicaea. And it's shortly after Constantine passed the Edict of Milan in the year 313, which was a glorious thing, which recognized Christianity the Catholic Church, officially at the political level. And it also, shortly after that, in a, by the year 401, was the end of all the gladiatorial games. And this was just a practice for the Romans. But it was, it took a saint to come out from the desert. I forget his name. It's a pretty long, complicated name. But he was a very simple saint for such a big name. And he walked out in the middle of the Colosseum when all the crowds were there and the gladiators were ready to shed blood. And he, he, he told the emperor, put an end to this bloodshed. This is displeasing to God. And of course they laughed at him and I, I think he was even killed or imprisoned. But that was the last of it. After that, there was no more gladiatorial games. So Rome took a big change, and it was the Catholic faith that converted Rome with the martyrdom of St. Peter, our first pope, and then all the tons of martyrs, up to 11 million martyrs, says St. Alphonsus. So it's in this, after this time, you would think, 10 waves of persecution since Christ founded his Catholic Church, the apostles were all put to death. And some of them extremely brutally and cruelly. Such as St. Bartholomew being skinned slowly alive. And then the ten waves of persecution from the Roman emperors. And then finally in 313 it all comes to a peaceful end. And the Catholics go back to what Catholics do. Large families... Catholic parishes and building beautiful cathedrals and basilicas. They kept building and building. And during the persecution, they would build also. A period of short peace, they would start building again churches. And then the persecutions would hit. So ten waves. So you'd think the Catholic Church, worn out and tired from all these persecutions, would have a break. But she doesn't. And she never will on this earth. The Catholic Church will always be attacked, always be at war. That's why it's called the Church Militant. And so what happens? The year 313, peace is made. Constantine professes the Catholic faith. He protects the Church. And the Church grows and spreads. And spreads everywhere, especially in Northern Africa and into the east and into uh, northern Italy and, and the, the, the monks are spreading everywhere and growth. But the devil, he sees the, the, the red horse of the apocalypse is not working anymore. So he pulls out the black horse. Remember the apocalypse sees four horses, the red, the black, the, the, the white, the red, the black, and the pale. The white horse is the apostles, 
preaching the pure faith. The red horse is the period of persecutions. But the black horse, what is this? The devil unleashes a new attack on the Catholic Church, which will be heresies. The rise of heresies, and that has never stopped. In fact, we're now at the, the worst of it all. Modernism, St. Pius X said, is the pit. It's the sewage pit of all the heresies. But in those days, the heresies were just starting, and they started to attack the Blessed Virgin Mary, that she's not the mother of God. She's just the mother of the man, Christ. So they said Christ was not God. And Arius, another priest, came out with this misinterpretation of the Bible. Christ says, the Father is greater than I. So if the Father is greater than I, and the Christ also says, no one is good but God alone. And Christ did say these words. Father, if it's possible, let this chalice pass from me. So Arius concludes, the Father is God. Jesus Christ is not God, but he's the highest prophet. He's higher than all the angels. He's the greatest saint, but he's not God. So this heresy takes root, and it spreads, and they, they quote Scripture. They misinterpret Scripture. And a whole new battle arises, and this one is so serious, most of the bishops in the Catholic world are infected with it. They're contaminated with the Arian heresy. And they have Mass, they quote the Scripture, they have ceremonies, but they're swamped in heresy. <clears throat> St. Jerome says, the whole world groaned to find itself gripped in the Arian heresy. So I like, I like to go back to these days because they're very close to our days. You've got a weak pope who excommunicates a heroic bishop, St. Athanasius. And it's official. There's a lot of controversy over this. But there doesn't need to be controversy. You have the documents of the church in the Denzinger, Schwarzmiller, which is the compendium of all the official documents of the church. And in there you can find in Latin, I, Pope Liberius, in union with all the bishops, condemn Athanasius. He is no longer in communion with us. That's called excommunication. And he is condemned and no one is to receive him anymore. But history proves who was canonized and who was the first pope not to be canonized, Pope Liberius. <coughs> he was weak, and he, he caved in to the pressure of the Arian heretics and bishops. But St. Athanasius, he's canonized, and he died a heroic saint. <coughs> and he's a champion, very similar to our days. Archbishop Lefebvre being excommunicated for standing up against the Vatican II avalanche of heresies and the destruction of our Mass with the new Mass. He stood like an Athanasius opposing this and came under the punishments of these bad popes who were pushing on us a whole new religion, which they didn't have the right to do, these popes. The papal authority is to hand down tradition, not to invent a new religion, a new church, and they call it a new church. They say it themselves. This is the new church of the new Pentecost. The new Advent, as Pope John Paul called it. The new uh, evolutionary church of Pope Francis with Pacamama equated to the Virgin Mary, which is a, the highest of insults. Because in the Mexican Latin, Latino culture, Pacamama is just one of the goddesses among the Virgin Mary. It's a terrible insult to her. <clears throat> so these days are very similar to ours because all the bishops, most of them, fell into heresy, except St. Athanasius, St. Jerome, St. Hilary of Poitiers, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom. So listen to his life. St. Eusebius, by birth a Sardinian, a lector in the city of Rome, was afterwards Bishop of Vercelli, for the ruling of which church it is worthy of belief that he was chosen by the divine judgment. For the appointed electors had never known of him before, but passed over their fellow citizens and chose him. As soon as they saw him, 
and he merely had to be present when he was chosen as soon as he was seen to be bishop. He was the first in the western regions to appoint monks to perform the duties of the clergy in his church, that there might be in the same person as the contempt of worldly things and the exactness of Levites. So he saw that priests formed in monasteries were, were better quality. The storms of the Arian heresy and impiety swept far and wide throughout the West, and he combated them so manfully that his unconquerable faith brought some consolation into the life of the sovereign pontiff Liberius. Wherefore, Pope Liberius, recognizing that the Spirit of God glowed in St. Eusebius, when he intimated to Eusebius that he should undertake the defense of the faith before the emperor in company with the pope's legates, he soon set out with them to Constantius, the emperor, before whom he pleaded so earnestly that he obtained all that was asked for by the embassy, namely that an assembly of bishops that should be held. The council assembled the following year at Milan in Italy, to which council St. Eusebius was invited, his presence being much desired by Constantius, and was also summoned by the legates of, of Pope Liberius. Here the Arian bishops assembled in a prefect synagogue of Satan, raging furiously against St. Athanasius. So the Arian bishops were pulling together to crush St. Athanasius and St. Eusebius. But they, they tried to fool St. Eusebius. Far from succeeding in bringing St. Eusebius over to their side, he, on the contrary, at once very plainly asserted that many of those present were known to him to be polluted by the stain of heresy. And as I said off to this, he suggested to them that they should affirm the Nicene Creed, wherefore they should be drawn into other matters. This being harshly refused by the infuriated Arian bishops, he not only himself refused to assent to the movement against Athanasius, but he most ingeniously set free the captive simplicity of St. Denis the martyr, who, deceived by the Arians, was assented to that, mo to that movement. So they tricked St. Denis, but he quickly snapped out of it. Just like many bishops fell for Vatican II, but a few of them snapped out of it, like Bishop de Castromayor, who joined with Archbishop Lefebvre. And think of Bishop Lazo in the Philippines, who late in his years in his retirement as a novice order bishop started reading the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre, started reading the history of the church, reading the, the Vatican Council heresies, and snapped out of the trance, and he declared himself traditional, and he condemned the new mass, he condemned the heirs of Vatican II publicly. So <clears throat> that was a great, a great victory for the, the church. And that happened here to St. Denis. Very uh, not the same for this Bishop Huondor, who is living now in the Society of St. Pius X house in, I think, in Germany or Switzerland. And he's, he's invited, he's, he's, he's there living as, with the priests at the Catholic school, but he's never renounced the new mass. He's never condemned Vatican II. He was a total ecumenist, giving communion in the hand, praying with the Jews, praying with Protestants, a terrible scandal, and he's never publicly rejected this. And he, Pope Francis is very pleased that he's working with the society, and his mission is to do exactly what's happening, break down the Catholic resistance, get the new SSPX compromised, which has already happened, and, and be peacefully swallowed into the conciliar church. So they almost swallowed St. Denis, the martyr, but he realized uh, what was being happening to him. So he snapped out of their trance, and St. Eusebius helped him. 
Wherefore, being exceedingly angry, the Arian bishops, after putting many insults against St. Eusebius, obtained that he be banished. But the holy man, shaking the dust off his feet, fearing neither the threats of the emperor nor the drawn swords, accepted the banishment as if it were a function of his sacred ministry. In being sent to Scythopolis, enduring hunger, thirst, whippings, and various tortures, St. Eusebius steadfastly despised his life for the faith, feared not his death, and gave up his body to the torturers. So the influence of the Arian bishops had him condemned to be put into exile. And also remember the Arian bishops conspired to have St. Athanasius excommunicated by the same Pope, Pope Liberius, who was weak. And they also had him condemned six times. St. Athanasius had to run for his life. He lived with the monks of the desert for over six years. That's where he wrote his Life of St. Anthony and many other books defending the divinity of Jesus Christ. So what was the whole controversy? What was the whole war? Whether or not you accepted Christ as God or just a man. That was the whole battle. That distinguished if you were a Catholic, traditional Catholic, or a modernist Catholic. So nothing new, really, under the his in the history of the church. And back then... Remember the great St. Anthony of the desert came out of the desert and walked through the city of Alexandria telling the people, stay with Bishop Athanasius. He has the faith. He preaches the true Catholic faith. Don't follow Arius, this phony bishop who's preaching heresy. And then St. Anthony worked many miracles in the streets to back up his position. So our times are very similar. They, they always called us, and they still do, uh, Lefebvreists. Oh, you're Lefebvreists, you're schismatics, you're renegades, you're, you're uh, disobedient. And these are titles of honor. And the Archbishop Lefebvre said it's a badge of honor to be excommunicated from this Church of Assisi, this Church of Vatican II. And now we can say this Church of Pacamama. This church of insults against God and bizarre and blasphemous ma new masses and ceremonies. We have nothing to do with that phony church. And St. Eusebius, how much he had to endure from the cruelty and insolent irreverence of the Arians. And mostly bishops. Mostly bishops sought his head. So think of what's just happening now. You know, the, the modernist, modernists, twice over modernists, Pope Francis, Cardinal Supic, who preaches in Chicago that the church doesn't need tradition. She's always evolving, which is pure heresy. And these guys are elevated. He's made a cardinal. And uh, Bishop Gregory in Washington, D.C., what, what an embarrassment to the Catholic Church. All these cowards, and they're like the Arian bishops, crushing tradition. And they're crushing one of their own, Bishop Strickland. So pray for Bishop Strickland and Cardinal Burke. These guys are now being ousted from the conciliar structure and punished. Why? Because they're just saying a few traditional things. And they're not even traditional. They are pro-Vatican II. They are pro-New Mass. So we got to pray for them because they, like many bishops in this time, snapped out of the, the trance. And imagine if Bishop Strickland came out and got, came out with like, like another Archbishop Lefebvre. What a blessing that would be. And Cardinal Burke, if he came out condemning Vatican II and the heresies, condemning the new mass. God can work that with these, these prelates. And certainly being coming under the heel of these modernists that might wake them up. And also uh, Archbishop Vigano. You know, the new SSPX doesn't really like Archbishop Vigano. There's no praise of him whatsoever. 
And Archbishop Vigano, he's come a long way. So pray for him. And now he's starting to do what Archbishop Lefebvre did. He wants to start seminaries. That's what needs to be done. And he needs to be definitely uh, conditionally reconsecrated as a bishop because he was consecrated in the Navasoto Rite, which is very doubtful. So <clears throat> Father Chazal recently said everything was done, but, well, we should have more objective evidence, more proof that he was conditionally um, uh, reconsecrated. But... So pray for these prelates. You know, it's a great grace in our time that these prelates are, are starting to wake up. But none of them compare to Archbishop Lefebvre. None of them, not yet. Not yet. Archbishop Lefebvre, he was such a grace for the church because he not only preached against heresy and error, against Vatican II and condemned the new mass, but he took action. He saw the way the church is going to survive this hurricane is form priests for tomorrow. Traditional Catholic priests formed well in tradition with sound doctrine. And he did that. And he gave the orders to his bishops. Don't you even think about making a dialogue and peace with modernist Rome until the Pope is perfectly Catholic, until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. And you and I understand that. It's simple. Is Rome back to tradition? No. Was it time for the agreement back in 2012? No. So why did they sign on the six conditions, which has never been revoked? Why did they sign the, doc doc the doctrinal declaration, which has still never been revoked, which accepts Vatican II in the light of tradition, accepts the new mass as legitimately promulgated, accepts the new code of canon law? And these errors are just as bad as the Arian heresy because they attack Christ as king, as God. They attack the Catholic Church as the supreme one church established by Christ and the spouse of Christ. So you see how similar these days are similar to ours. So what happened to St. Eusebius of Vercelli? So he, he, he was exiled. From that, it is also made clear that the Arian bishops were unable, either by threats and inhuman cruelty, ever to frighten him, or by the flattering subtlety of the serpent to pervert him to their party. Look, we'll pull you out of this exile. Just sign this document. Just you don't even have to say you support the Arian heresy. Just be silent against it. This was the little tricks they tried to play on him. And he wouldn't fall for it. And he told them, you're not going to silence me. You're not going to silence me. I'm going to continue to preach against your heresies. But they were able to do this with the new SSPX, with Bishop Fillet and the new leaders. Just accept the new mass a little bit. Just say it's legitimately promulgated. That's all. And silent, tone it down against Pope Francis. Don't condemn Pacamama. Don't condemn his synod. And do you ever hear it condemned anymore by the society bishops? Silence. <coughs> Absolute silence. Cowardly silence. Sinful silence. Because when bishops and priests are silent against heresy and errors, they are responsible for the murder of souls. It's a murderous silence. And, and then, um, you know, any dancing with the new mass is a scandal. If I start promoting the new mass miracles, which I was asked to do if I want to get holy oils, uh, that's dancing with the devil. That's dancing with the devil. And these so-called new mass Eucharistic miracles, we can't trust them. Our Lord warned us. There will be prodigies and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Be careful with those and those who say that the new Mass nourishes your faith, that the new Mass is not so bad. Just look for the most conservative one. And if you, are, if you need to go to confession, look for the most conservative Novisoto bishop or Novisoto priest. 
Well, be careful, because he might not even be a priest with this Navasoda ordinations. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, as a general rule, conditionally reordained them. So, so these Arians persecuted Eusebius, and if they couldn't get him by hitting them with the stick, they attracted him with the chocolates and the carrots. But he didn't fall for it. But, sad to say, our bishops of tradition fell for it. They fell for the, the candies of Rome. And Bishop Fillet accepted it. And now they're, now they're silent. You don't hear them anymore. Very rarely. And at, and at, and at most, a little, a little peep. When before, you all know, certainly the older ones here, you all know the old SSPX, it was headline news. If, if Pope Francis pulled in Pacamama, that was condemned on all the pulpits, in all the letters, the Angelus magazine, the bishops would preach against this, and the synod, the scandalous synod, approving the whole rainbow movement, which is a terrible scandal, and the downfall of the men of the church. Where's the outcry? Silence. And this is what the devil wants. But thank God we have models in, before us. St. Athanasius, he was never silent, nor St. Eusebius. And their preaching was a pain in the neck to the Arian bishops. Finally, being banished from Scythopolis into Cap Cappadocia, that's now modern Turkey, and finally for his constancy in the Catholic faith, he was banned to the upper Tibet of Egypt, which is <laughs> the armpit of the world. It's desert, just desert caves, desert land, where the monks lived. He suffered the hardships of exile until the death of Constantius. After that, he received permission to return to his flock, but he would not go back before taking himself to the Alexandrian Synod, to heal the wounds of the church, and afterwards, like a skillful doctor, traveling all over the provinces of the East, he restored the infirm of faith to sound health. What's that mean? He restored the health of their doubts and reaffirmed Christ is God, and here's why, here's the proofs, and the greatest proof is his own resurrection from the dead. He is God, and those people who were doubtful and and hearing the arguments of the Arian heretics, they were, some of them were wobbling in the faith, and he strengthened them. No, we adore Christ as God. He is the second person in union with the Father and the Holy Ghost from all eternity. He is not a creature. He is only has a beginning in his human nature, but in his divine nature, he's from eternity. And read the scriptures. The Arians only quote what they want, but they forget the other quotes where Christ says, I and the Father are one. I preach not my doctrine, but my Father's, because my Father and I are one from all eternity. One in substance was, is the Greek meaning, the Greek word, which shows substance and not just a, a unity of, of, of a moral union. And the miracles, Christ received adoration. The man that was cured as from leprosy or the man that was uh, born blind, when he cured them, these men came to our Lord and adored him. If Christ was not God, St. Eusebius would preach. If he wasn't God, he would say, don't adore me, adore God. But because Christ was God, he accepted adoration because he's truly God and he worked the miracles that only God can do. So he strengthened the faith just like Archbishop Lefebvre strengthened the faith of all the Catholics throughout the world. And he conditionally reconfirmed those confirmed in the Navas Ordo, because he said these Navas Ordo oils are doubtful. These Navas Ordo sacraments are doubtful. Now the new SSPX says, no problem, they're all valid. And that's simply not true. It's, it's bad theology. And they know that. The priests of our generation all know that. They know better. He established them firmly in the Catholic doctrine. Thence, 
With the same healthful results, he departed for Illyricum, which is in Greece, <clears throat> and at length reached Italy, which on his return put off, put off her garments of mourning. There he later published Origen's commentaries on all the Psalms, which he himself had expurgated, and those of Eusebius of Caesarea, which he had translated from Greek into Latin. At last, eminently famous for so many deeds, in the reign of Valent Valentinian and Valens, he set out from Vercelli for that unfading crown of glory which he had merited by so many hardships, and died a martyr, St. Eusebius of Vercelli. So these great champions in that period of the church, of the Arian heresy, they're, they're good examples for us. And our time is much worse because the heresy is worse. Modernism is, is widespread and it's everywhere. Even in traditional priests, many traditional priests who say the Latin Mass are infected with modernism. And how would you know? If any priest says, well, Adam and Eve... We can't be sure they really existed. Or Noah's Ark was just a fairy tale and a myth. They're modernists. Don't, don't believe them. And when they discredit the book of Genesis especially, they're modernists. And one of the principal foundations of modernism, as St. Pius X said, is evolution. And they don't believe in the, the book of Genesis. Yet, how often Christ himself refers to Genesis. He refers to Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. He refers to Adam. He refers to Noah. He refers to Jonah and the whale. He doesn't doubt these things. Christ himself shows the authority of, of what's written in the book of Genesis and the six days of creation. So modernists, they come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, just like liberalism. And let's be truthful, all of us have grown up in this liberal, modernist age, this age of apostasy. We're all in some way infected with it. We really are. Even Archbishop Lefebvre, he said, when I entered the seminary in Rome, I believed in the separation of church and state. I thought it was a great thing, but that's a heresy condemned by the church. And he had to discover the true teaching of the church. So this was Archbishop Lefebvre as a man, a young man. So we're all infected and we have to wash, detox. We have to detox from all the poisonous chemtrails of heresies and modernism. And how do we do this? Firstly, prayer. Secondly, repentance for our sins and good confessions. Thirdly, we have to study. We have to study and know our catechism well and read all of Archbishop Lefebvre's works. Read as much as you can. And this one is real steak and potatoes. Father Dennis Fahey. Try to read him. Uh, he's tough and he's deep, but he's good. And certainly priests need to read him because he, 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 he's really good. And Archbishop Lefebvre praised his works, Father Dennis Fahey, who tackles a lot of the modern problems and shows Freemasonry, Judaism, are at the root of the infiltration inside the church. And then, of course, we have to read the papal encyclicals. And, and a glorious encyclical that's very easy to understand is Quas Primas of Pius XI on the social kingship of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. It really is a banner of Catholic tradition. Read it and study it. It's not that difficult either. Pascendi is difficult of Pius X. That's a tough one. And you've got to read it several times. But, but as you read it, you'll get more out of it. All the encyclicals of Pope Leo XIII are clear. Sometimes very deep, but good and solid. Very sound. And in, in those, he condemns separation of church and state. He condemns the liberty of the press, liberty of the speech, liberty of teaching what you want. He would certainly condemn liberty of the internet, the church in her normal. When we get a good pope, he's going to call for the censorship of the internet. He will call for that. 
and he has a duty to. The bishop should be demanding this, you know, but the internet is in the hands of the enemies of Jesus Christ, so they censor all the doctors and nurses that are saying some truth, and they're knocking them off of YouTube. I've ha I have the honor of being kicked off, what, 10, 12 times by now? <laughs> so it's an honor. But, uh, but all the filth, and especially pornography and false religions and even Satanism is promoted, that's not censored. None of that is censored, but the state should censor the real filth because it does harm to souls and it destroys innocence, destroys men, women, marriages. So that's what's beautiful about these days of St. Athanasius. Our times are very similar. So we got to detox from the modernism and above all, devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is so beautiful. She is so pure. She is, there's no way we can praise her enough. There's no music that could be written to honor her enough. But I'm sure our Lord arranges that in heaven. The most beautiful music is honoring his mother by the angels. And the most beautiful poetry, the most beautiful everything for Our Lady. Because she's the mother of God. And she's that unfading rose that never wilts. It's the innocent dove. She's compared to cinnamon in scripture. Cinnamon. And, and now we know cinnamon has good effects. It cleans out parasites in your system. So the Virgin Mary cleans out the parasites like cinnamon out of our system of modernism and liberalism. She helps clean that out and come back to sound thinking. And the Virgin Mary is the pillar of tradition. She's the pillar of the pure Catholic faith, unadulterated with heresy and error. And that's why she's the bulwark of the Catholic faith. Any heretics who want to destroy the church, they first come after her. Which explains why Pope John XXIII never revealed the third secret of Fatima. He slapped Our Lady in the face with his opening speech of Vatican II. Pope Pius XI and XII never did the consecration. So they, uh, they might be in purgatory until it's done. <laughs> uh, and then Paul VI, uh, he consented at Vatican II not to consecrate Russia. When Archbishop Lefebvre presented the 400 plus signatures, please consecrate Russia and condemn communism. Put in the drawer. Pope Paul VI also was responsible for they wanted, the good bishops at Vatican II wanted to declare Mary mediatrix of all graces. He canned that. That would offend the Protestants. So they slapped Our Lady in the face. And that draws down the anger of God. So when they downplay Our Lady, and in the liturgy, they really demoted her in many feasts. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which was a beautiful feast, a duplex of the... Of the a duplex, a very high feast, was just put to a de-ranked to a commemoration. So these insults to Our Lady are signs of the modernists destroying the church. So let's love Our Lady, be close to her, keep her rosary, her scapular. And, you know, you might think, yeah, I do that every day. It's simple. It's part of my daily life anyway, so why do you keep talking about it? Because we don't realize the power of these weapons. We just don't. But God knows the power of the rosary. He knows the power of the rosary. And he, that's why Our Lady told Sister Lucia, God has given special grace and power to the recitation of the rosary. In these times. Just for our times. So trust in that grace. Any problems you have... Pray the rosary with more attention and devotion and humility and confidence. Our Lady will solve it. She will solve all the problems. And we always have problems. Personal problems with sin. <coughs> personal problems. Health problems. Family problems. Relative problems. Neighbor problems. Job problems. Co-worker problems. Boss problems. There's always problems. Money problems. Allergy problems. National problems, international problems. And all of this can be solved by the rosary. That's the confidence 
all the saints have in this weapon. So we are in war, little flock, and you know Our Lady foretells after this terrible time of the church history, we will enter into the sixth age of the church, which will be the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But even then, the Catholic Church will be in battle. There'll probably be new, new forms of heresies. There'll arise new problems and new attacks on the church from within and from without. So never is the church without warfare on this earth. So we got to be committed to the battle to the day we die. So little flock here in Georgia, persevere in the battle. And let's turn to Our Lady. Let's ask St. Eusebius of Vercelli to grant us uh, the fighting spirit that he had. He was quite a warrior and a good bishop. Let's pray God gives us good bishops like Archbishop Lefebvre and pray for the bishops of, Arch of Archbishop Lefebvre that they come back as St. John says in the Apocalypse, you have lost your first devotion. You have lost your first fervor. Come back to your first charity. Come back to the fight of Archbishop Lefebvre for which you were consecrated for. Come back to just holding his clear position and rebuilding the Catholic Church from the ground up and condemning the errors <clears throat> that need to be condemned loud and clear like St. Eusebius did. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.